Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 111 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by my co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamualaikum, Assalamualaikum, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Yeah, everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone's doing well, enjoying these last days of Ramadan. Um, man, I don't know what it is. This year, more than any, and I know people, this is like one of those sort of commonly mentioned things or people, people, something that people say every year after year, whereas like, but this year, for some reason, I cannot believe we're already in the last 10 days. Like, I do not know where the month yes. of Ramadan went, like super fast. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I I hundred percent agree. I I don't know. I don't know why. But I don't either. Because last year, I get it. Like I don't really recall if I was one of those who said that the month went too fast or did it. You know, whatever. Because we were in the beginning of the pandemic. Nothing was open. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't doing anything. I was just at home fasting. Right. This year, as things now, you know, we find ourselves hopefully, inshallah, at the tail end, especially here in America. I know things are differently in other parts of the world, and our thoughts and our hearts and our prayers go to those people who are still suffering in places like India and, and other places, Brazil and other places where the pandemic is still raging uncontrollably. However, here in America, uh, you know, things have obviously gone or returning somewhat back to normal. Uh, I find myself going to mosques again more frequently, not only Juma now, I'm going nightly for Tarawih prayers and so on. And so I get it. So there's like this sense of like return to normalcy, but that still doesn't explain why, like, I feel like, uh, yeah, like where did this month go? I cannot believe we are here in like day 20 or, or day 21 or something like that. It's, it's unbelievable. No, I, I 100%, I 100% agree. And I, I usually don't say, you know, don't say it always goes by that fast. Sometimes it's like it's a it's a pretty long it's month. Normal. This, this year, <laughs> yeah, yeah, normal exactly. This year it's gone by like I cannot believe it. And it's and it's not like I'm taking long naps or you know sleeping the day away or doing anything out of the ordinary to make to to lose the time. I I really don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um. So I I uh, I know that you are. Um. I mean, in addition to like, I think did you uh obviously commenting on ramadan but i mean you also got vaccinated in the month of ramadan like your second vaccine yeah 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 so, yeah that's right so i did miss a couple of days i had full full on side effects and all that um took a was couple the days first off, dose hydrated before ramadan i can't remember i know we talked about it on the show the, the first dose was just was a couple weeks before ramadan the second moderna was um uh, during uh and uh yeah i had I had all the side effects um you know the chills the fever the headache the body ache uh the malaise uh but yeah no feeling good now and, and you know to be honest uh going out just with a lot more comfort i mean my daughter started school uh which was great uh the younger one the older one was bummed that she couldn't she, she her, her school decided not to have her grade go back so she's super bummed about that which is funny oh, right really funny. i didn't realize yeah. that so so you're you're in the neighboring district i i'm i haven't expressed it on the show but i'm really disappointed at what our district did which is essentially told teachers and parents that we're not going to be coming back until the next school year maybe like i'm still kind of i don't know i i there's so much politics there i don't know what's going on but uh you guys are in the neighboring district and i heard that y'all reopened like this week yeah yeah like, i was super jealous so yeah, but yeah they did that only for certain grades they did it for pretty much all grades except my older one's in eighth grade, uh, so I, they didn't, for whatever reason, the, hers was the one grade they didn't do it for. But the younger one, the the third grade. Wait, so they did it? Was it eighth and up, or just eighth grade? No, in no, particular. Just, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Exactly. What's the line? Know, like, there's no scientific reason for that. I think it was just about what they could accommodate. For yeah, I think it was a purely logistics issue. But she's super bummed out. Uh, the eight, the third graders. Uh, you know, super happy. She's popping Driving. up every day, like six thirty a.m. <laughs> right, which she never did before. She would always like it was like a drag to get her out of bed before, but now she's like popping up, getting herself ready. You know, seven ten awesome. seven o'clock. She like, yeah, yeah. It's Can't great. wait it's great. to see my kids do that again. Um, how, so how many days a week does she go back? It's it's four days. It's Tuesday through Friday. And wow. kudos, huge kudos to the teachers because it is a logistical from just for four weeks of going back. It's like a logistical major feat you know so it is huge, but in i, I like, ways, really appreciate the teachers yeah i mean as someone who's married to a teacher i mean uh, like i know my wife would have appreciated the little bit of a kind of a it's just almost like a trial it's almost like a little trial run that they're doing for next year mm -hmm. because next year 
you know, may look essentially the same as it looks right now, meaning some form of social distancing, maybe getting the kids to wear masks and so on. A return to ca- uh, classrooms. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Like, are they going to mandate masks oh, forever? I mean, for kids? Oh, you mean next year? You know, no, you yeah. mean next No, I, I, yeah, I was referring year. to this year. Yeah, this year there's, yeah. there's like uh, masks. There's like plastic barriers between between the, the desks there's mm-hmm. you know a bunch of bunch of rules and it's only like a three hour a day to be honest or two and a half hour a day so it's um, so I, the kids who the kids the kids who are back in person do yeah. the morning and then the r- distance learning is in the afternoon so as a father of two kids who are under the age of 16 um what are your thoughts on like the possibility that like or what are your thoughts if the country if, if the government decides to roll out vaccines for younger people yeah i mean i'm gonna follow the science for sure the older one um, yeah. if she, you know, as soon as it's ready and then my younger one, eventually, you know, if, if it's being done, you know, go with the flow, I guess. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I asked that I'm not like not to put you on the spot. I mean, I, 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 I yeah, I, I agree. I'm the same way, uh, because I have, uh, my older daughter already got vaccinated with me. Uh, oh, and just to catch up uh, listeners where I am, I, I have my first dose in, uh, I'll be having my second dose next weekend, so I'm looking forward to it, although it is the last few nights of Ramadan. In fact, I'm getting vaccinated on the 27th of Ramadan, uh, which mm. is Saturday. Uh, so, inshallah, everything goes well. It's it's Pfizer, so I'm hearing less uh, reaction among people who are getting the second shot of Pfizer, but it's totally up in the air in terms of uh, you know how people are reacting. And so both me and my daughter are going to get vaccinated. She's 18. But for my younger daughter, yeah, I mean, if they make a vaccine available for kids under the age of 16, uh, then I'm certainly going to, uh, I, I, w- I would want to get my daughter vaccinated. I mean, uh, you know, assuming that everything else is the same with the vaccine, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's interesting to see what's happening nationally. I think that we are over 50% vaccinated. We are over, uh, well, over 50% of the population, mm-hmm. I think, of adults have at least one shot in their arms. If mm-hmm. not, but, but in a matter of weeks, that'll be two shots. So I imagine the numbers will go uh, exponentially up. But I mean, that's, to me, the only kind of feasible way out of this is to either, is to get enough of the population vaccinated where you develop some sort of herd immunity and then you can kind of go back to normal. Otherwise I don't see us ever, ever sort of getting out of this until the vaccine completely dies off, which is not likely that that's going to happen. I think it's always going to be out there uh, in some form, whether it's as obviously maybe not as rampant in the community as it is now, but it's certainly going to be there. And so how, how long can you, can you sort of keep locking down? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we're in a, we're like the U.S. is an an exception here, right? We got, we, we procured all the vaccine, but globally, it's only a few percent. I don't know what the exact number is right now. Last time I I looked, it was just a couple of percent. It's not even, To vaccinate the entire world would be like years, right? It it is, right. But I mean, so then, so what do we do here in America then? I mean, and in fact, you don't have to even go that far. I mean, even I know north of the border, Canada has been terrible in, in vaccine rollouts. It's been really bad there. Yeah, they just don't have they just don't have access like 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 we do, right? But I mean, we didn't have access either. But it was like it it was really the federal government marshaling all resources to allow for. I think I think Biden said in the State of the Union or whatever that was a couple of weeks ago, where he said, "Yeah, within a five mile radius, four mile radius, every American has access to a to a facility no, that I- is administering the vaccine." Yeah, and within a hundred days in 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 an office, he has procured or he has uh, put you know two hundred twenty million shot shots in arms. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I mean, I'm hopeful. I'm I'm definitely um, I'm definitely planning on resuming activities pretty resuming soon. Resuming activities, so. I do, yeah. So I'm curious. So like uh, resuming activities for me is already included, as I mentioned, the like the good stuff first, which is going yeah. to the mosque <laughs> and being a good little dutiful. Beautiful Muslim. Uh, but what about, but I'm also, I've also hit the movie theaters uh, and this was before Ramadan, but um, yeah. So no, what, no, is, what does the return of life for you look like? Omar? Um, You're yeah, a little like bit more cautious course. than I am just generally as yeah. a person. I've so far, I've only done, you know, the basics like grocery stores and, and restaurants. Oh, but even that and, started and, more, re- more recently. I was, <laughs> right, right. I was in yeah. March, I was in February of last year going to grocery stores. So yeah. 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 So for example, I'm going to go, I'm going to go visit and show my parents in a couple of weeks Good. and then, Good. um, definitely, you know, 
definitely, obviously, maybe Joma if I can get get that. Um, um, what else? Like maybe maybe movie theaters, maybe even theme parks. We'll see. A lot of maybes there. I, 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 want, I want some more definitive answers on the record. <laughs> sure. There you go. I have vested interest, especially in the in the latter, uh, because I'd love to go hit a movie with you, and and yeah, maybe even go to. Uh, I'm not into theme parks, but I know the kids love it, and so yeah, I, I join you on on your uh, on your foray into theme parks. Maybe is pretty much I'm planning on it, barring some unforeseen circumstances, right? So. We'll do it. Let's do it. We'll catch a movie. Okay, great, great. I, I have you on the record. That's all I wanted. Uh, that's great, man. Um, okay, well, anyway, um, uh, you know, it, it is Ramadan, and, uh, you know, we wanted to highlight, we wanted to continue talking about immigrant stories, and that was kind of the genesis for uh, the next, uh, our, our show today, and, and our guest on the show today, uh, but also uh, kind of an added bonus in this month of Ramadan uh, we also get the uh, blessing of being able to highlight a very important uh, Muslim charity uh, here in the Bay Area. Uh, and so, Omar, please uh, tell us who we have on the show and uh, welcome our guest. Or, sorry, welcome our uh, yeah guest to the show. Yeah, absolutely. So, Rahima Foundation is an amazing organization here, based here in the in the Bay Area. Uh, they make sure that um, those those in need are are given uh, resources in terms like for example food is is essentially like a food pantry um and and they've been doing great work in the community here in the bay area for uh for for several years um so our guests are the, their founders we thought we'd highlight a little about what they're doing but also dive into the backgrounds of um of uh, the founders of the organization so our guests are habiba hussein um and ishrat hussein uh Habiba Hussein, who we, who we refer to as Auntie Habiba, came to the U.S. in 1962 as a high school foreign exchange student from Turkey. Uh, she completed high school and went on to earn a degree in pharmacy from Temple in, in Philadelphia. And that's where she met um, uh, her husband, Ishrat Hussein. And in 1973, they moved to the Bay Area. Uh, since then, she has uh, created uh, or founded Rahima. And the organization has impacted half a million lives through food and financial assistance uh, in those years. Uh, they serve. They specialize in ser- serving indi- indigenous people, refugees, immigrants, um, and the like who are struggling to meet their basic human needs. Um, and inspired by her faith, her relentless service is a testament to her compassion and dedication. Um, Uncle uh, Ishrat, Ishrat Hussain, he was born in Aligarh in India, but he grew up in Karachi uh, in Pakistan and moved to and migrated to the U.S. in 1966. He has a bachelor's a degree from the University of Karachi and a master's degree in physics from the University of Pennsylvania. And he also has a master's degree in electrical engineering from Farley Dickinson University. And he worked in the tech industry for several years, but retired from IBM in 2013 and joined the Rahima Foundation as his executive director and president at that time. So we are super, uh, super excited and super honored to have um, Auntie uh, Habiba and Uncle Ishrat here today. Uh, thanks, Omar. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I'm delighted to have Auntie and Uncle on the show. Um, and, you know, our, uh, w- one of the intentions among, I think, a couple uh, about wanting to have uh, both um, Ishrat Uncle and Abiba Auntie on the, on, the call, on, the, on, the, on the show today is to continue our sort of um, tradition of doing immigrant stories um, and then uh, get into the kind of work that Rahima Foundation is doing um, both locally uh, as well as nationally. So um, we, we can definitely kind of talk about that. But I guess to kind of start things off, as we often like to do, um, Omar, um, you know, I, I think it'd be great to just ask, um, you know, and I'll defer to Ishrat Uncle or Habib Monty who wants to go first. But um, we'd love to get sort of a background about, you know, um, where you come from, and then we can get into some, maybe some of your early uh, sort of experiences and childhood memories that you have and um, how those experiences shaped, uh, you know, who you would become as adults. So, again, I, I defer to either of you to sort of take that question and, and, and go with it. Uh, well, salam alaikum. Thank you very much for having us uh, on, on your show. Uh, my name is Habiba Mir Hussein. I am from Turkey. I grew up in uh, southern Turkey, a city called um, Adana, and I uh, went to uh, my schooling there. The last year of high school, uh, I entered a competition. 
uh, which was nationwide uh, to be chosen by uh, uh, an organization called the American Field Service. And I was the only one from my city who was uh, selected. I was one of the 90 people uh, across Turkey who came to spend the last year of high school in the United States. I stayed with an American family. This was part of the, the, uh, the scholarship and uh, uh, attended high school in upstate New York in a small town called Sydney, New York. And then I went back to Turkey uh, after uh, uh, finishing the high school because they did not accept the American uh, year. This was just an, uh, a bonus. Uh, so I finished the a high school in Turkey, and then in 1961-62 academic year, I got another scholarship for uh, five years. Uh, I came to United States to attend college. I went to school in University of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque for uh, uh, three years. Then I transferred to Philadelphia Temple University. Finished my uh, last two years of uh, college, five years, because I was studying pharmacy. Pharmacy uh, was five years those days. And it sounds yeah, like, uh, like uh, the family you came from was very much into education. Uh, can you tell us a little about that? Is that your family background, a very educated family? Well, uh, was it my the, yes, my family uh, 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 actually belonged to uh, Bukhara, uh, Samarkand, in Central Asia. And during the communist revolutions, they uh, uh, escaped from uh, Russia uh, under Russian rule. And uh, uh, they were big uh, zamindars, uh, uh, silk uh, uh, growing silk uh, and producing. So those were the people, most of them were, were sent to Kulak cam camps. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, so therefore, uh, they were one of the targets of the, the uh, communism to be destroyed. Uh, so when they came to Turkey, uh, they did value a great deal to make sure that uh, we uh, get what uh, we, uh, uh, they wished for us. And my father particularly was uh, very open-minded, even like this was almost uh, 55 years ago, uh, half a century ago at those days, uh, girls did not, uh, were not sent uh, away from home for education mostly. Uh, but uh, he was very open-minded when I won the, the uh, scholarship. He, uh, my whole family uh, supported me a great deal. So, uh, alhamdulillah, I'm grateful for them to, uh, to allow uh, a, a daughter to, to uh, halfway across the world uh, by herself. And they, they trusted uh, me and my father, may Allah bless his soul, said that I can give you a lot of advice, but you're young, you're going to forget it. But there's one thing that I want to tell you, protect your uh, faith and protect your honor and dignity. And sure enough, those three uh, words stayed with me all through uh, temptations of being a young girl, uh, coming to a co-ed university. I was, uh, I was educated in all girls' schools, but alhamdulillah, that piece of advice kept me uh, uh, to protect my, uh, my faith and uh, my honor and dignity. Um, th th that's such a, yeah, I think I, like you said, uh, Auntie, um, I think in any um, sort of immigrant background, um, you know, that would be something unusual to, 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 to be able to be open to sending your young daughter, um, you know, across the ocean, several countries away, certainly a Western country like the United States. So um, it's a very fascinating um, sort of uh, piece of, 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 your, of, your, of your background. Um, I, I'm a little curious because um, one, you mentioned just sort of growing up in Turkey, um, and then you brought in the additional element of which I didn't know, um, that your, back, your family actually themselves were immigrants to Turkey from Central Asia. Um, right. escaping from the uh, communist regime there. Um, was that 
that migration from Central Asia, uh, Bukhara, Samarkand area, mm -hmm. formerly, uh, mm -hmm. the, to Turkey, was that sort of a common, like for those who, who, who escaped communism, uh, Muslims who did so, did they, was there a large group, of, like was, was there a mass migration to Turkey or other parts of the world that you know of? Um, I think there was a, a sizable shift uh, because early childhood of my uh, years uh, were spent in uh, uh, Afghanistan and there was a group of people who had gone through this ordeal of uh, escaping from, uh, from uh, Central Asia. Uh, my parents uh, essentially the Bukhara and Samarkand; those are the the, the areas well known. But they were uh, they owned a lot of uh, farmlands, and they had um, uh, they had wealth. So communism was after the wealthy people to take their wealth and distribute it. So they, they m many of my grandparents were sent uh, to uh, Siberia, and many of our relatives were sent to U Ukraine. Uh, uh, Ukraine, but only my uh, parents, uh, nucleus, my, my mother, father, and my uh, my uh, oldest brother who passed away after uh, words. The three of them were able to escape, uh, uh, giving the smugglers uh, a lot of money to get them to uh, to bring it uh, over. So whenever I see the news these days in the southern borders of. Uh, 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 United States uh, brings back memories of those. I don't have the memories of that, of course, of how they escaped, uh, but I grew up on the stories of how difficult it was and how uh, uh, dangerous it was for them to uh, have escaped. Uh, uh, and there, well, then m there must have been a sizable um, uh, number of them that the Turkish government want to, to intervene and bring these people to Turkey because uh, after the war Turkey also had lost uh, a lot of population as well as um, uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, was eliminated and uh, Khilafat was no longer there but the new republic uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, wanted to bring all the Turkic people uh, to to uh, Turkey in uh, in his time uh, and after his regime, we did not come during his regime, but we came during the uh, Adnan Menderes and Jalal Bayar's regime. And I remember uh, uh, vaguely hearing the stories uh, that they were really. Uh, very much interested to bring the, the, the Turkey people uh, to Turkey. So we, my parents settled down in, uh, uh, in southern Turkey, and that's where I went to uh, uh, elementary school, uh, junior high and high school, and then I uh, got a scholarship, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, to come to the United States, and uh, then uh, uh, went back to Turkey, finished my high school, and then I got a five-year scholarship again to come to study uh, uh, in the United States. And then when I was in Philadelphia, I met my husband, Ishrat. He was at the University of Pennsylvania, and that the rest of this history, if you have any yeah. other questions, now I'll let now my husband talk about his background. Oh, absolutely. I'm very excited to get to Ishrat Uncle. Uh, if you don't mind, one last question I do have for you, Auntie, uh, about yes. this phase of your life. Mm -hmm. Because again, I, like I said, I, I've, you know, I think our listeners will find it so fascinating because we haven't had a guest, um, you know, from, from Turkey to talk about this is, is, um, you know, growing up, you know, like you mentioned, key figures in in Turkish history, certainly post-World War, uh, post-fall of the Khilafat in the, uh, World War One, um, you know, Atatürk, of course, being, you know, sort of primary there. Um, and Atatürk, of course, was known for the push of secularization uh, that occurs in, in, in Turkey. Um, by the time you sort of become a young woman and you begin to sort of, uh, you know, obviously be more aware of what's happening politically, I would imagine, in Turkey. Um, 
what was that balance or what was that like in terms of religious life? I mean, was there still this idea of Westernization and secularization or was it that Islam had begun to, had begun to, you know, really sort of, re, you know, uh, re, reemerge as kind of a primary identifier for Turkish people? Well, I cannot say for all the other Turkish people, but because mm -hmm. my family had a very a strong religious background, they did emphasize at home that, um, but at, in school, we did have religious courses as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, modernization, definitely, it was uh, uh, taking place. Uh, the mm -hmm. alphabets had already been changed by the time I went to school from uh, uh, old Turkish into a, a, a Latin alphabet. Uh, so, uh, uh, frankly, while I was going to school, I was not really, I was totally concentrated on, on getting the best grades. I was not, those days there was no uh, TV. Uh, hardly anybody also had uh, 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 radio and uh, Thank God we did have radio, and uh, so we were listening uh, to uh, to the uh, news. My parents were listening definitely much more because uh, uh, I was supposed to be studying when after I come back from home. Uh, so uh, uh, that part of the history of Turkey uh, since then until about four years ago, it's been just sort of a very... Uh, 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 opaque for me. And about four years ago, when I re-initiated uh, myself to really go back to Turkey uh, with a very open eye, now I'm just trying to catch up the history, what happened between um, uh, uh, the, the passing of uh, uh, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, and uh, current regime. I'm not, I, I'm not the person to really uh, give any opinion on those things. And no, I think just sharing your experiences has uh, really been valuable. So thank you for that. Um, so as promised, I, I definitely want to sort of pick up uh, uh, your story, uh, Ishrath Uncle. Now, what's interesting is Philadelphia, uh, interestingly enough, for whatever reason, there must have been some something in Philadelphia, um, because so many of our past guests have, you know, their origin stories, Philadelphia somewhere, you know, somehow or somewhere yeah. factors into their background. So it's fascinating that Philadelphia also serves as, uh, you know, a touchstone here um, and, and certainly the city where you two meet, which is which is wonderful. So, um, Ishra Lankal, again, welcome to the show. And, um, you know, I, 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 as we kind of did with Auntie, um, I, I'd love for you to kind of talk about your background uh, as well. And then, uh, yeah, and then I guess maybe catch us up to what brings you to um, the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, and Philadelphia. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for having us. Um, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, as it's called, right? So there's some attraction. That is uh, correct. Um, but anyway, I was born in uh, the city of Aligarh in India. And when I was two years old, the partition took place. So not, I mean, it's a similar story of migration, which is more like a forced migration. Uh, from India to Pakistan that took place. Of course, I don't remember any of it at two years of age. Um, but we grew up with those stories, right? And the horrors, the dangers, the risks, the sacrifices, the resettling. I mean, it was just a huge, huge thing uh, for, for my parents to have born. Not all our family moved. So we still have relatives in India, but a lot of them did. Um, and so, so I grew up in Pakistan up to the age of uh, 20, 21, I guess. Um, and then uh, after, sort of I came to the United States by accident in a way, because I didn't really had any plans or intentions. I was just studying and, and continuing. I was studying physics 
at the University of Karachi. And one day I went to visit one of my friends, uh, another student at the university, and, and he told me that he's applying for these colleges and in the United States and elsewhere. And it's, it's very interesting and they have all these programs and good PhD programs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I thought, well, it, maybe I should apply. You know, sounds like an interesting thing. So I just went, went ahead and applied to very few places. Um, and I got accepted at University of Pennsylvania with, uh, with a fellowship. Uh, so that was obviously required. I, would, I wouldn't have been able to come without that. Um, so that, that's how I came, is, is, to, is to study. And my plan was certainly to study, finish, and then go back, you know, and maybe teach there or, or join some, some cooperation in, in Pakistan. But then happened, we got, uh, we got married from two different places, right? So she would not uh, fit there too well. She doesn't speak the language. I won't fit in Turkey. I don't speak the language. So we yeah. said, well, let's just stay here. You've touched on, you, you very quickly touched on what uh, I definitely want to hear more details about. So I, I would love to hear about your experiences uh, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, both of your experiences, and what it was like as students there in the, presumably the, was it the late 60s, I guess? Yeah, uh, early seventies. Yeah. Okay, sixties. I'd love to hear about that. Like that. And then, also, you know, tell us uh, more. You know, how you met, and and a little more about that as well. So, sixty six is when I came, and uh, so I was there at University of Pennsylvania. We had a international house; they called it. But there was a lot of foreign students, and the university needed. They realized they needed some space for all these foreigners who come from all over the world uh, to just get together, to have a room there in some, in some cases, and a big social sort of gathering in that area. So a lot of people got together there. Um, we didn't meet at the, at the international house. Uh, we had a very small community of Muslims and at University of Pennsylvania, we had formed a little organization in a way. And one of the senior most people there, Brother Abedin, Zainul Abedin, uh, Rahimullah, he was a wonderful person. And he was the senior person. He was the president of, the, of that club, in a way. And so they had a Juma uh, organized. And so I obviously was attending that Juma prayers. In fact, I may have been giving the khutbah that, that time for Juma when she arrived. I had a friend, a, a woman uh, from Turkey who was one of the students at University of Pennsylvania. So there was nothing romantic in our relationship. It was simply friends from, you know, common backgrounds in a way. So she came to the Juma prayers, and she had this other person who was a very attractive young woman. So <laughs> I was a bit distracted giving the khutbah. But in any case, she introduced me and said, this is a, a person who has just arrived from Turkey and blah, 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 and you must meet the, and get to know each other. So I said, well, sure, yeah. So that's, uh, that's really how we met. That's amazing. Uh, I'm curious, again, just because Philadelphia, like I said, does factor in. Um, it, do, do you remember which like uh, masjid or mosque this is? Is this the one on State Street? I mean, I, I've heard of the history of sort of that institution. Yeah. Was there one on campus? Yeah, this was just a small group on campus for the university students. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Um, and, and were you studying physics at, at the University of Pennsylvania, you, you continued yes. physics? I did, yeah, but I didn't finish my PhD. I went to a master's and a little bit above, and I just got tired of, uh, of too much theoretical stuff. I wanted to go into some practical. So I changed my uh, subject to electrical engineering, and 
then got a master's in electrical engineering from a different university, but but nonetheless, it was different. So I, I imagine a question that you get asked a lot, um, you know, and again, I'm just thinking about my own family. So I apologize if I'm interjecting, you know, I, you know, baggage that might be unique to my family. But I would imagine, uh, you know, having that conversation with your family back home and both of you, for both of you, um, that, well, I've met someone, um, you know, she's from Turkey. He's from, you know, uh, Pakistan by way of India or India by way of Pakistan. Um, and and uh, here we are in the United States. Um, was there, you know, friction? Was there any kind of pushback uh, to, you know, wanting you to marry someone from your own uh, sort of ethnic background? And and I'd love Auntie to start with that question, Andy, and maybe okay. even uh, to answer that, and also share her perspective of that <laughs> of that initial meeting too. I'd love to hear uh, young, uh, uh, good-looking <laughs> Khatib. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, um, of course, I went to uh, Temple University, which was on the other side of the city. But this uh, young uh, young friend of mine, uh, 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 we stayed at the um, uh, hostel for uh, um, because I I went from the University of New Mexico to interview with Temple University uh, to have a transfer uh, to come to Philadelphia, and I stayed in this. Uh, 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 y YMCA, YWCA, uh, the, for a few few nights, and I met this uh, lady from Turkey. Of course, we bonded together, and I told her that if uh, I get admitted here, I will be coming uh, back in a, uh, by by fall. So she said, definitely, let's exchange our uh, the addresses when you come back. Uh, let's get together. So when I came back to Philadelphia, again, a part of my scholarship was that I should stay with an American family. Uh, and so I stayed with the American family, but I co contacted this uh, friend of mine. Her name is Adia. And so she was very happy. And she said, oh, well, uh, we had a group of Muslims at the University of Pennsylvania, where she used to go also, uh, and said uh, uh, if you, your schedule allows one Friday, I'll take you there so you can meet some Muslim uh, 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 friends there. Uh, uh, there's not a whole lot of Turkish people at this time here. So she said, uh, but you'll meet other Muslims. So that's how I went to, to uh, 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 Juma prayers at the University of Pennsylvania. And that's what... Uh, 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 Evidently, she was trying to uh, match us in her mind. That's the reason she uh, 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 took me there, because she kept on saying on the way, you know, I have a, a kid brother uh, the, who is so wonderful here. She was uh, older, maybe a few years older than Ishrat. Uh, I have a kid brother from Pakistan. He's so wonderful. And I kept on thinking, why is she keep on talking about this person? So she had actually knew that he's going to give the khutbah. So that made arrangement for me to be there. So that's why. And then afterwards, she said, that's my kid brother who gave the khutbah. <laughs> so he said, I want you to meet, meet him. I said, well, I, I'll meet a whole lot of people here. I'm glad you brought me here because I had no intention of staying in America. Afterwards, I had all my vision, what I want to do in Turkey and how I'm, I want to uh, go possibly in politics and all that. But uh, fate brought us together and somehow uh, uh, the Hedia's kid brother become, uh, became my uh, fiancé and we had yeah. our nikah. And, uh, but uh, of course my parents uh, uh, were uh, expecting that I will be coming back and uh, I had all these dreams and visions that I used to talk to them. And they said that, how about all what your, uh, uh, but my father, again, very uh, open-minded person and said that just as long as he's Muslim and says, la ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, we give our blessings. Uh, my mother wasn't that happy because she wanted me back, but of course, when I got my father's blessing, my mother had to uh, bless that too. Yeah, so in um, 
in my case, uh, well, the reason I would say that he was so open-minded about many things is because he belonged to Sufi tradition, and in Sufi tradition, people are generally very open-minded people, the people of the heart, you know. So anyway, um, in my case, yes, there was opposition. Before I was going to come, my mother had suggested one of my cousins, her sister's daughter, <laughs> that, but uh, <laughs> to, to uh, consider. So I told her, look, she's a wonderful person, but I really don't have that kind of feelings towards her. So, uh, but I told her, but you have to give me permission that if I do find somebody that I have these kinds of feelings for, uh, to be a wife, that it will be okay with you. And she said, yes, of course, uh, uh, that's fine. Uh, of course, she was not thinking that it, it would actually happen, right? But when it, when it happened, I wrote to them that this is what's going on here, and I would like to get your blessings to be able to marry this person. It was a huge surprise. And, you know, I mean, we are nine kids in the family. Um, however, they wanted everybody close to them. And especially those that were doing better in school, like I was in university and so on and so forth, that I would have a brighter future. And that would be the place where they can have their grandchildren, this, that. So they were disappointed for sure. And my mother told me that I don't think you will come back now uh, to Pakistan like permanently. So I said, well, uh, I have the intentions, but you know, Allah knows. So she was, the, was more uh, forthcoming in a way to, to give her blessings and, and so on. But my father was not too happy. and. In any case, uh, once they reluctantly agreed, so we, we proceeded. But years later, when I went to Pakistan, I asked my mother, I said, uh, was Ammu, we call him Ammu, was Ammu really uh, not too happy with us? Uh, she said he wasn't, she said, yeah, he, he wasn't too happy, but he agreed at the end because you, this is what you wanted. And, your happiness and, and so on is what was the right thing. So he accepted it at the end, but it was a struggle for sure. What and this was probably just exactly about 50 years ago, right? I'm, I'm guessing? We are That's 50, correct. We are married for 54 that. years. Yeah. Oh, mashallah. Okay, we great. We married in uh, 1968. 68, okay. Um, yeah, no, thank you for well, sharing. I, I was actually... I'm uh, sorry, I was no, actually no. ready to move to Pakistan because I did not want to stay in America. I mean, for, I, by this time I had stayed uh, uh, almost uh, seven, eight years in America and I thought, no, I want to go to a uh, Muslim country and uh, do contribute to, to the Muslim society, whether it should be Turkey or uh, Pakistan. But then uh, uh, we had uh, uh, twins uh, the, within a couple of years, my son Adnan and my daughter Sophia. Uh, that uh, made the change in my mind. I have got to, uh, to raise these kids here. And so that's, that's how we, we stayed. Because I was open to idea that uh, I will, if need be, absolutely we will go to Pakistan. But we ended up in, uh, in America, and alhamdulillah, for the past 50 odd years, I've been in community service. So uh, that service desire that contribute to the Muslim society, whether in Turkey or uh, in Pakistan, Allah Ta'ala arranged it for me to uh, be active here in the United States. I actually wasn't aware that you, ha you even had, had children. I, I just didn't, wasn't aware of that. So you have... Uh, a boy and a girl? Is that a, a twin? I have to, uh, we, uh, yeah, the first ones are uh, uh, the uh, twins, uh, Adnan, he's a professor of uh, medieval Islam, uh, Europe and Islamic history at Queen's University in Canada, 
and uh, my uh, daughter is here in California and pa Palo Alto. Uh, she also graduated from Berkeley. My son graduated, got his PhD from Berkeley. And then we had uh, another daughter, uh, Jasmine, which is uh, uh, also graduated from uh, uh, Berkeley, but got her PhD in uh, the Western history. Um, but uh, she's not uh, a professor. She's in, in private industry. So I have three children, and one of them are uh, uh, here in California. The two of them are far away. <laughs> Mashallah. Uh, I, it, apparently, academics and 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 uh, academic excellence continues in the family. Um, so that's that that, that is wonderful. Um, you know, uh, there's so much about your backgrounds that I find so fascinating. Um, you know, but you know, we, we can save that for uh, another conversation, uh, inshallah, in the future. Um, I, I would love to kind of pick up, um, and uh, Umar, Umar alluded to this, but, uh, you know, 1960s America, um, and, and you two as being young immigrants, um, uh, two, two sort of, I guess, connected questions. One, you know, what was the Muslim community like, uh, specifically, I guess, in Philadelphia, um, you know, and then number two, uh, you know, perhaps br more broadly, um, you know, what, how would you characterize American attitudes, at least the people that you encountered towards um, Muslims or immigrants in particular uh, at that time in the late 60s? Because, I mean, obviously a lot is going on in America, uh, social upheaval, you know, um, civil rights movements and so on. I mean, a lot is going on in America in the late 60s. Um, you know, Vietnam War. So, um, yeah. you know, uh, a fa what I would love to sort of factor into that is, you know, what are American responses to uh, immigrants? Um, you know, and, and certainly I think this is would be a learning experience for both Umar and myself because, you know, our parents' stories are very similar to yours um, in the sense of coming here as immigrants and um, in the late 60s, uh, early 70s and, and settling here. So either either either. Well, were both of you uh, to respond to that? Um, let me start. Um, so first of all, uh, when I arrived in Philadelphia, somebody had given the name of this brother I, I mentioned about him earlier, um, Mr. Yeah. Abedin, yeah. So in, in Karachi, somebody knew him somehow. I don't know how, but they said, when you go to Philadelphia, look him up. That, which is what I did. I immediately got hold of him, told him that I was referred to him and so on. And he, of course, took me in right away, introduced me to the rest of the people. So the com Muslim community was very small at the time. I mean, I was primarily exposed to just the students at that time. But of course, at that time, the black Muslim uh, was very much in the news, uh, you know, uh, Malcolm X, and 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 even the non-Muslims who were who were uh, in the fight for their for their civil rights and so on. So, of course, we were famil familiar with all of that, but there was very little interaction at that time. I I did meet. Uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, he came to our university I and mean, he was the champion those days. Uh, he came to our university to give a talk and I attended and then talked to him a little bit. A very fascinating, uh, dynamic uh, person. So that was sort of my introduction to, to someone who was a black Muslim and very outspoken person. He didn't hide anything. He was very uh, assertive about who he was and what he believed and what was the right thing and so on and so forth. It's sort of similar to, in a way, to Malcolm X as well. Um, so, so that was sort of the community. Now, larger, I would say, in the interaction with other uh, with the other uh, students uh, at the university, I can say from my personal experience that I never encountered any bias towards me. Uh, they, they, uh, they talked to me, uh, they, they never rejected anything that, uh, or either openly or, or otherwise that I know of. 
Um, so they were very accommodating. The families, I would say mostly they didn't know much about Islam or Muslims. The mm -hmm. only thing they knew more about the Muslims was, was the black Muslims. That's, that's, and sometimes uh, I remember somebody had brought that up and uh, I, you know, we talked a little bit about that, but, you know, I did not associate with the black Muslim movement and neither did the rest of the common people associated, me or other immigrants, uh, with the black Muslim, which is a kind of an, a very interesting thing because today, anything that happens in the world even, we get dragged into it, right? And, and this is the power of the social media, the TV and, and this and that. And I would say because Muslims are more in the news, there is more things happening in the world um, with the US involvement in the Middle East and so on and so forth that all that has had some impact to this. And of course, the community of Muslims has increased tremendously since we moved. You know, there's a handful of people. In the Bay Area, for example, the, you had to go through yellow pages, which my wife and I did when we came here to find any other Muslim person. There was no masjid, there was no school. I'm talking about South Bay. San Francisco had an Islamic center where we took our kids when, when we first came here. So if I could pause you before we get to the Bay Area, because I, I would love to pick up on that, uh, that sure, journal yeah. of the story. Um, uh, Auntie, if you had any thoughts, if not, I sort of had a follow-up question to something that uh, Ishrat uncle just said. You can have the follow-up question. <laughs> okay. Or thank you. you. Just for the sake of our listeners, I, I wanted to, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ishrat Uncle, for sharing that. Um, I, I think uh, when you talk about the Nation of Islam and how immigrant Muslims were probably having to respond, or, or in this case, not having to respond to what whatever was going on with the nation, I think is fascinating because you sort of made that connection to today, on the other hand, you know, we are, as an American Muslim community, find ourselves having to respond to anything that happens, you know, abroad uh, or domestically. So kind of an interesting juxtaposition there. Um, uh, and then I, I just wanted to like sort of call attention to, you know, where your story intersects, as I mentioned, you know, I, I did mention earlier the city of Philadelphia, um, you know, two past guests of the show, at least, well, at least three actually, whose stories uh, right around the late sixties begin to emerge uh, not so much with the nation, but actually with Sunni Islam, but converts, um, you know, specifically Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Sherman Jackson, and Dr. Essan Bagby come to mind, um, all of whom ha have stories that intersect with uh, Philadelphia, or they're, they're actually from Philadelphia in two of their cases. Um, you know, and, and again, their experience is not so much being connected um, to the nation of Islam, but certainly having to respond to or acknowledge the existence of that movement um, in the city of Philadelphia. So kind of a fascinating, um, again, intersection between episodes and, and what have you. Um, but I, I, having said that, I, you know, Auntie, I, I, like I said, I would love for you to sort of comment on anything, you know, that Ishrat Uncle shared and your experience in the, in the, in the late 60s. Uh, I'm also fascinated to hear about New Mexico, um, New Mexico versus mm. Philadelphia. Like, yeah. what was New Mexico like? And, and again, any interaction with the Muslim community there? Yes. Okay. So I came uh, as a foreign exchange student in early uh, 60s, 61, 62. Mm. Uh, this, the, uh, at the high school, the purpose of this organization, American Field Service, is to get to to know different nations. So that's why uh, uh, we were selected from all over the world. Um, and uh, I w was staying with a family um, uh, at, uh, in a small town. Um, I had never seen, uh, in Turkey, I had not experienced to see any African people at all. So uh, the first African uh, uh, American African person I saw was the the maid of this uh, uh, family. 
uh, who would come for cleaning once every two weeks or so. And uh, that was my first exposure to a black uh, a person. I had uh, heard, of course, we studied uh, in high school Africa and um, uh, the uh, African people at that Ottoman uh, period and all that, but physically I had not really seen uh, one. Uh, so that was a very uh, interesting, uh, because I thought America is all white, blonde, blue eye people, but what is this person is coming to do the cleaning? But anyhow, uh, uh, Around that time, also this uh, Farrakhan movement and um, uh, this, uh, these people, the, one of my, my purpose to be there was to give a lot of talks in different TV stations, different clubs, Rotary clubs and Lion clubs. And so almost every weekend I was invited uh, to a, a different group of people uh, uh, to give some talk about Turkey and uh, what is just like you're asking, what is my impression of America and all that. So in all my encounter, this uh, 11 uh, months was only with predominantly 99% white Americans. And uh, then at the end of the, the year, all the f foreign students from around the world were invited to go uh, on a field trip uh, all the way. If people were stationed in California, they had to come to Washington, D.C. So uh, about two weeks, uh, my group from upstate New York and Connecticut and the foreign exchange students, we were through a, with a bus tour, went all the way to uh, uh, North and South Carolina. And that's where I saw the two different America. In the North, you hardly ever see um, uh, uh, anyone. And in, in, in uh, Southern states, it's predominantly African-Americans. So I was really uh, very much surprised that this many uh, people live in, uh, of course, through some uh, minor history that we studied in Turkey, and we know that there was slavery in America and all that. That's when I came to realization that while well, that was true, that what I had read, and here they are the offsprings of those slave people are essentially again uh, working for domestic uh, uh, work and all that. So that's amazing. You actually got to go to the White House. And from what I understand, you actually got to see John F. Kennedy as well. Tell us about that experience. Uh, yes, uh, part of our uh, scholarship was that uh, all the 1,000 students that year from different countries all over the world uh, would merge in Washington, D.C. after having tours of different monuments. And then at the end, uh, we would gather at the uh, at the White House lawns, uh, which we did, and uh, John F. Kennedy came out, uh, gave us a, a welcome speech, as well as wishing us good luck, and uh, this program that uh, is designed for uh, people of different nations and um, uh, get to know each other. And he said that uh, we hope you had a good experience in the United States and uh, best of luck with the rest of your life and uh, uh, a safe journey back to your uh, countries. And hopefully what you learn from America, you will share within, uh, with your own societies. So therefore that uh, uh, program ended uh, each uh, nationality, um, uh, our leaders, a leader, a team leader collected us and we boarded the um, uh, buses. Uh, my bus, the Turkish uh, group, uh, uh, head to Canada and we went to Canada and boarded uh, a ship from, um, uh, uh, I guess, Montreal. Uh, yes, I think it was Montreal. And uh, uh, we crossed the Atlantic and landed in um, uh, France. And from France, uh, uh, the, we were uh, 
we took the plane and uh, ended up in Istanbul and all the families from different cities were there to uh, receive their uh, students and my, my uh, mother and my brother was there to receive uh, me and then uh, uh, we, from there we went home uh, uh, to, to South Turkey at that time. My parents were living in other. So that ended up my journey uh, of this foreign exchange student uh, uh, life. And then after uh, um, uh, a year, uh, uh, I applied for a scholarship to come back to the United States to study uh, as uh, at the university. Uh, I was given a scholarship at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And when I came to Albuquerque, it was totally the, the scene of the America that I had not seen. It was just, I felt like maybe I'm in a, in a uh, Middle Eastern uh, country. Uh, but nevertheless, I adapted quickly and uh, uh, st started my studies over there. After three years, I realized that the field of uh, pharmacology, pharmacy that I was studying, it will be much better that I transferred to a university in Philadelphia uh, called Temple University. And uh, uh, I, my transfer was accepted. And that's where I started uh, my uh, fourth year of college, uh, where I met uh, Ishrat. Uh, he was also studying at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, I guess he, he can tell me how we we met. I think last time he covered it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We we heard we heard his perspective, and it's great to get, it's great to get your perspective as well. Um, so so maybe tell us. I, I know we t we talked a little about that, um, but now you know you get married and um, you're in the East Coast at this time, right? You're in, you're That's in Philadelphia. Right. Did you stay there long before um, out coming out west? Uh, yes, we stayed maybe a couple of years. We stayed about a year in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and then uh, uh, we remained in Pennsylvania, uh, the, where we had our uh, uh, first uh, children, twins. Uh, my son, Adnan, and my daughter, Sophia, uh, the, were born in uh, uh, outskirts of uh, Philadelphia. And uh, they were about a year old or no, three years old, I believe. Uh, then uh, uh, we came to uh, California in 1973. Yeah, they were uh, three years old. Uh, so we stayed in the East Coast about three years after getting married. And then we came to California in 1973. What, uh, what, what brought you to uh, the West Coast? Well, it's my fault. I okay. <laughs> fault or credit, depending well, on how you're looking at it. We we have taken up, uh, like a, I had taken a job in Florida for, for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And and then I realized that the field I was in, which was um, high tech, that uh, Florida was really not the center of it. There's a lot more opportunities to the Bay Area was just starting to grow at the time, early 70s, we're talking about. Right. And but so, you were, in, a, in, a, in a essence, in, you were in early Silicon Valley in, import, huh? That's correct. Yeah, so that, that's what brought us here because I got a job at the National Semiconductor, which doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, but it's an early pi pioneer in, in the space, for sure. That's right. I mean, it was a name, um, not only in the Bay Area, but I imagine nationally. Um, so what was the early 70s? I mean, in terms of tech, uh, you said that the Bay Area was beginning to sort of come to be known as the place that obviously it would become. Uh, is that is that correct? Or was it already somewhat established? Yeah. Well, it was established to some okay. extent, um, but I mean, obviously nothing like what we have, but uh, it was a very early part, which was mostly about semiconductors. Uh, so semiconductors was the start of this whole thing, and then became the microprocessor at Intel. 
So Intel was doing semiconductors just like Fairchild and and also National were doing. But then Intel went into this a new thing, microprocessor. So they developed that, and that's what really took off. That's right. After that. that, okay. I didn't. I don't know, Omar, if you yeah, yeah. The history. It's super interesting, and that's why, of course, the name Silicon Valley. And this was all in the literally in the Valley area, right? I believe it's in the in the San Ho- the San Jose Santa Clara area, right? Because I think East Bay at this time is very industrial. San Francisco oh, is right. is basically like a quaint cultural town. Um, tell us a little about that. Just kind of yeah. Tell us, like you know, obviously, is it very centralized? Are you in this? Are you in the Santa Clara San Jose area? Are yes. you venturing out? North at all? What's that like? Well, we we moved to Sunnyvale, of, of, of our first house, and his job was maybe uh, at the, uh, five to ten minutes, very close to his, uh, uh, his workplace. And uh, the whole valley was, for example, from Sunnyvale to go to Los Gatos, it was like going out in the country. The whole area was filled with the cherry and apricot, uh, the orchards. It was very beautiful. And today, where the, uh, the, the, the what is the arena, the Levi's uh, Stadium, that areas, uh, there was wild horses were running. So it was a very, very uh, a widespread, beautiful uh, orchards and wildlife uh, and the, the developments were not there at all uh, so uh, uh, but within about 10 years you could not recognize the place and so he was right he kept on saying in florida uh, things are happening in california we have to move <laughs> to california things are happening and sure enough things started happening and many, many other uh, the, uh, uh, companies uh, started. But when it came to Muslim community, yeah. we did not have a single masjid. And so but by this time, my children were, uh, my twins were three years old. And I wanted to make sure that they have some uh, friends, uh, Muslim friends, and we need to gather. So what I did is essentially literally took the San Jose uh, directory, telephone directory. Those days, of course, we didn't have cell phones Mm -hmm. and all that. I went through the directory trying to locate Muslim uh, names so we could um, get together. And through the the directory, I found three names. One was, uh, uh, may Allah bless their souls, uh, the Qureshi families in uh, uh, Palo Alto. Uh, and the other one was um, uh, uh, Zafar Sheikh, uh, may Allah give him a long life, uh, his family, and another one, an uh, uh, Egyptian family. So with these three families, I said, why not we get our children together and we should meet at least once a month, uh, once a week uh, for, for us to get together. So at the meantime, while I was trying to find some children, for my kids to be a friend, Ishrat was also looking for some people to uh, to do the Juma, and then he can tell you the the Juma prayers, the first Juma prayers in the Silicon Valley. How he? Uh, I'd love to hear about that as well. But I have to I have to ask. So you literally went through. Uh, probably hundreds of pages of, 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 of yellow page or, or the phone directory to, to find three Muslim names approximately that, that you were able to get in touch with, right? That's right. That's right. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously worth noting, you, you know, the Qureshi family, which, you know, they, they, of course, become sort of an institution. Um, do, you, do you recall what, like, your children would correspond with Asifa, like, I mean, you know, do you know which children, like, were the same age, etc.? Because I know... Asifa uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, my children correspond with uh, Halima and uh, Amara. Asifa was a little older. At the meantime, while I was trying to find these families, uh, we wanted to see if there is a masjid. And we 
uh, found out that there is a masjid in San Francisco. Uh, the, what is that called? The Crescent, Crescent Islamic Center, Street, Islamic Center of uh, uh, the San Francisco on Crescent Street. So I used to take my children, uh, well, sometimes Ishad accompany me. I would take them to, to San Francisco. And over there, we met uh, Wahid Siddiqui uh, and uh, Manzur Ghori. Uh, wow. They were not living in the Silicon Valley area at that time. Right. Uh, so uh, it was difficult for them to 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 join us. Uh, so after about a year or eight months of commuting to uh, San Francisco, uh, then I realized that okay, I have to uh, uh, start something at uh, in S uh, San Jose area, Sunnyvale area, and I started the Sunday school. Um, uh, and that's also a story uh, that. Uh, we're together now. But let, before that, I'd like Ishra to talk about how the Juma prayers in yeah. Silicon Valley started. Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned some real sort of names of some several pioneers of our community, uh, including, you know, uh, Manzur Wari and uh, as well as the Qureshis. Um, and then you're there with them. That's the, it's, it's really amazing to see these few families and where you all become sort of pioneers of the, of the Muslim community, not only here in the Bay Area, but I think, like I said, nationally as well. Um, but yeah, we would love to hear that. And, and of course, I, I can't help but chuckle or marvel at the fact that the mosque that you find in San Francisco is on Crescent Street. I mean, the, you know, that's not, I don't think that's by accident. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, uh, Ishad Uncle, if you want to sort of come in with your perspective, I would love to hear it. Um, also, I guess, you know, you're, I mean, you're working in Silicon Valley, um, you know, uh, is there a lot of Muslims that you encounter? What is that like? Yeah, so, uh, like I said, we, I started working at National Semiconductor in um, March of 1973. And at that time, of course, uh, companies were new. National was a new company. And and so were all the others, Intel and Fairchild. Uh, so it was something we were kind of working and developing as things were happening because there was no history here, right? Semiconductors themselves were new, the companies were new, so working with new technologies was sort of like a startup, but not exactly startup because they had already started up and and there was a number of employees and things were to some extent established, but very early during those days. And you're right about uh, the casual situation came years later, right? So those days it was more like, uh, I would say more closer to the East Coast type culture than West Coast. Um, but um, I mean, we all worked very hard, you know, you can imagine those days. Um, so. We worked long days, and of course, during that time, there was time for prayers, right? So I, what to do? So I would just go outside the building, wherever I could find some space, and especially Zohar prayers was, was always at work. So I would go and pray sometimes over there, um, mostly outside, because that's where there was some open areas and I could find some space. So. So, uh, Brother Salim Sheikh Marhum, uh, I don't know if you, you knew him or not, but he was one of the early people in South Bay. Um, he was, he was uh, a young man, just like myself, and it turns out he was also a national semiconductor. And so he saw me from a distance, I guess, that I was praying. So, of course, he... Uh, after that, he got together, introduced himself, and and we became close friends. Since uh, after that, right? So then he said, "Why don't this is, they, this is in the lawn? This is just in the parking. Where is it? Yeah, Where did it's in, right? yeah in, the, in the in the grass. Yeah, on the grass. Oh wow! So then he said that you know there are conference rooms inside. But why don't we both of us pray together in the conference? in the conference room and hope that nobody uh, will show up <laughs> while we are praying. So, so that's what then, that was the next step we did is to pray Zohar. 
So we did that, and then it occurred to us that uh, on Fridays, we need to have Juma prayers, not just regular Zohar prayers. So we started to gather. There was a couple other people we found. So we went to the uh, Fair Oaks Park, which is right on Fair Oaks Avenue in Sunnyvale. It was very close, not that far from where we worked. So we just went there in that park. And four of us started the Juma prayers. And they insisted that I should lead for whatever reason. Uh, I guess I was the only one with the beard or something, but in any case, so I stumbled through and, and we started that. Some Fridays we were only three people. So we didn't, uh, uh, we didn't do, there was two people. Yeah, we were two people sometimes, so we, we couldn't have Juma. We just did our normal Zohar prayers and went back to work. But those were the days, you know, it's just unbelievable. That's that's how things got started here. And then we moved the Juma sometimes, which would rain. Uh, we moved the Juma to our house because we were very yeah. close um, national semiconductor. So they would come and do uh, the, uh, the Juma at, at our house at that time. And when I I was not familiar at all with Juma prayers that it requires. Uh, a uh, minimum of uh, uh, how many? Three, three, people. three people. And I would tell him that, how come you didn't give a talk today? So he explained to me what Juma is, uh, because I grew up uh, uh, as a young person in Turkey at that time, we didn't used to go to, to uh, mosques. So he explained that we need that another person to be there. So then I said that, well, uh, Mercy Dolan, and may Allah bless his soul. Mm. Uh, I had met him uh, at the San Francisco uh, school. And, uh, he is probably working in this area. Let's see if we can, he can join so you people will have the quorum. So Mercy Dalim was the next one. That he, he is one of the uh, early pioneers because he was one of the founders of Crescent Street uh, uh, Masjid. Uh, so um, he uh, joined that. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask about the Crescent Mosque uh, or the or the, the the Crescent Street Islamic Center there. Um, do do you know like who was running it? Was it was it largely immigrant based or was it also you had like sort of like uh, the African American community or anything like that? No, it was it was it's immigrant, immigrant based. based. It's the family last name Mirza. The, I mean, we have some Mirzas also mm -hmm. in the Bay Area you now. But it was, you know, the older generation of Mirza family. Okay. May Allah bless them. Evidently, there were quite a few Pakistanis uh, had moved in the early uh, 10, 20, 30 years before Silicon Valley became. And they were mainly hotel owners, big uh, business people, uh, living in San Francisco and Sacramento area. And so these are the, the Khan families and Mirza families. So uh, it was uh, their children. Uh, they were grown up. Uh, they were almost our 60, 70 year old people, but their children, grandchildren were uh, participating in the, in the school in San Francisco. And I, I believe I'm not sure that they were the founders of uh, Crescent uh, uh, master at that time. Your brother Ahmed Mirza was, was the main person. Uh, at the, who started that masjid? And, and you said that it, yes. that community predates you by 20, 30 years. So we were, we're talking like the 1950s, like right after World War II or something. That's I think so because they were big. Uh, they, are, they, they were big hotel owners as well, the ones in Sacramento area. Uh, the, uh, they were farmers, big yeah. farmers, uh, big uh, farming families uh, established in Yuba City and places like that. Uh, and they are still have their children, grandchildren, and uh, uh, their offsprings are still uh, active in these yeah. two cities. Amazing, amazing. Um, 
Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we went back and 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 discussed that because you know that, that that's sort of an unknown part of the history that we haven't uh, discussed previously with anyone. So thank you for that insight. Um, I, I want to make sure I pick up any thread where we left off. But, oh yeah, you were talking about. Uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, you mentioned brother or you said Mercy Dolan. Mm -hmm. I don't remember him. Uh, he, 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 you said one of the early was, pioneers, so like South Bay Muslim community? South Bay community, yes. Recently, about a couple of years ago, he passed away. And all his life, uh, he was very uh, involved. Uh, the San Francisco, Yuba City Masjid. Uh, he, he was a, a, a Danish uh, convert. Muslim. Of course. <laughs> Uh, he um, passed away until uh, the, the, his later times. He was also very active in the South Bay Islamic Association. I, I'm completely, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I completely blanked on the name. Of course, I, I met him several, several times at the downtown location. Um, right, yeah, in, in right. fact, I remember wanting to have him on the show because I remember he once told me after Juma how when he got married, and I don't remember when this was, I don't know if he, got, he, if he was already married by the time you met him, but he talks about getting married and, and inviting all of the Muslims he could find. And I think it was like maybe 10 or 15 families. And so yeah. I knew right then when I, when he mentioned that just anecdotally that, oh my God, like, like this person has this breadth of knowledge of the Bay area. Um, unfortunately before, anything happened, you know, he got ill and then he was in the hospital for a while. Mm -hmm. I visited him in the hospital and then he, 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 he passed oh, away okay. afterwards. Um, yeah, always, always a smiling, uh, cheering face at the, uh, downtown center. Right. Yes, he was. Yeah. He was president of SBIA for a while. Before that, he was also president of the San Francisco the Crescent Mosque. I see. Wow. So, Regretfully, yeah, we were unable to capture that uh, history. Uh, but I would love for you to kind of talk about that then, um, you, like meeting him. And then, like you said, now you have a few families in the South Bay, yeah, Silicon Valley area specifically. And uh, I guess the early days of SBIA then, South Bay Islamic Association. There was no SBIA oh, at of that course. time. Yeah, just, I meant like starting yeah, it off it or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the the number of uh, congregation grew from uh, three to five, six people, then mm -hmm. it was not possible to hold it in our uh, uh, the apartment uh, in our house. And then I went to uh, Sunnyvale uh, uh, Community Center and I asked them if we could rent a room. From them, and I clearly remember for two hours we rented a room for $20. Uh, and so now the, the Juma prayers started uh, uh, at the Sunnyvale Community Center. That's a deal, uh, even by, well, it's certainly by Bay Area standards. <laughs> Do you remember what yeah. year this was? Uh, mm. Probably 74, 74, 74, 74. Still, still relatively early. So yeah. I'd love to hear how, how you're seeing as you go through the 70s and get into the 80s, how, how are you experiencing the community grow? I'm sure both tech are hiring, uh, you know, more diverse folks, but also just generally immigrants. And then kids are growing up too, right? And families are presumably over time growing. I'd love to hear that about that. How's that? How, how are you seeing the growth? Speaking of kids and family, um, you know, and we mentioned the Qureshis, are, are they doing, are they still, are they doing their camp at this time? Yes, they were doing yes, the camp, sure. but there was no, uh, because the camp was drawing people from all over California, because numbers were uh, small, they had started the camp, but there was not enough people in the community in Silicon Valley to start a school, until we came with two, and they had three at that time, children, and then uh, Zafar Sheikh had two, then we had uh, and uh, the Egyptian family, uh, uh, brother Abu Bakr, had about four children. So we had a classroom now to to uh, uh, hold this 
uh, Sunday school. So the first Sunday school we started, and I went to Lakewood Elementary School in uh, Sunnyvale to see if I can get a room from them. To, uh, to first we gathered together a, a few times in the in the park that they were praying before, but then this was not possible to hold classes. So I went to elementary school and I asked the principal uh, that we are a, a group of Muslim families here, five, six families, and we want to teach our children. Uh, is that possible that we can rent a room? So he told me that, uh, he said, well, probably you really don't know the, the history of this country. We don't mix religion with uh, uh, public facilities. However, he said, I worked in uh, Saudi Arabia, and I know that your religion is, is part of your culture. So why don't you write a letter to me saying that we are a few families who are here. We want to teach our uh, children our way of life and culture. This way, he said, uh, I can uh, uh, do something for you. So I went home and wrote that. That's what he coached me. And because if he had to have some sort of a document. So with that documents, he not only gave us a room, the, the whole uh, stadium, I mean, the gymnasium, the, the gymnasium and uh, several rooms in the, in the uh, classroom, every Sunday we could go over there. So once we started uh, with 10, 15 students there, the word spread out to Fremont. Uh, at that time, quite a few people started moving. Silicon Valley is becoming very well known now. So it's drawing the uh, people, uh, scientists and engineers from across the United States. So more and more people started moving. A lot of uh, people, like five, six or 10 families in Newark, they settled down, the housing was being developed, um, uh, new housing uh, sections. So they heard about this uh, Sunnyvale school. They started coming within a year. Uh, we had 90 students, uh, 90 children, and together, they're of course, their parents, and they heard that there's Juma uh, is happening. Uh, they started uh, coming for Juma prayers. So the school and the Juma prayers were the foundation of of the these mosques uh, that uh, started. Uh, at, at this time, we should get another uh, job uh, in the East Coast, so we were gone for about three years to the East Coast before we came back for the second time in, uh, to California. Um, when we came back, uh, by this time, uh, South Bay Islamic Association, the downtown masjid was purchased, and there was a full-fledged masjid in the area. And then in addition to that, close to the industry, uh, the Marhum um, Mahu uh, Khan from Los Angeles had moved, and um, with his uh, efforts and with uh, a few other brothers' efforts, they had rented a, a warehouse uh, near Scotts Boulevard, uh, near MCA. They were having Juma prayers there, and the downtown people were having it in the sec uh, Third Street uh, uh, Masjid. So there were two mosques. One warehouse, one full-fledged mosque in the area. Uh, so, but in three years, that much progress had happened that uh, you know, hundreds of families had come to to the area, and there was a need for two two places to pray Juma prayers. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, just to see how fast the, the 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 Bay Area has been has been growing, and it's funny when you mention Newark. I actually live in Newark now, and I so I I I, I love history, so I'd, I'd love to to you know get a sense of of how the area was uh, beforehand. But yeah, I, and I did hear from some some folks, uh, friends of mine who grew up in in this area, um, that they lived you know just a few blocks from my house. Uh, so that's super exciting. But yeah, so 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 as the Muslim community grows. We probably get into the 90s, and um, you now start having uh, inspiration to do something else, which is the Rahima Foundation. I would love to hear about the genesis and birth of of that. What when, what when did the idea first pop into your head, 
and when did you and how did you decide to actually do something with that idea? Okay, before that, uh, when we come, uh, we came back from the east uh, second times to California from East Coast. I realized that there is uh, these people are renting a, a warehouse. And there is no uh, uh, children's schools there. Uh, so I started another Sunday school at the, this warehouse on Scotts Boulevard. Mm, and at the meantime, uh, there, was, uh, there was talk of the group. of, of They were calling themselves a Muslim uh, MCA, I mean, Muslim uh, uh, organization. Um, no, Muslim Student Organization, MSA. They were calling themselves MSA. But um, uh, so they were talking of purchasing a, a place. Uh, uh, it came Ramadan, and uh, uh, I was shopping in this Arabic store, which is the only Arabic store that uh, was in the area. And I saw some um, uh, uh, sister, and I said that we have a Sunday school if you have children. You can uh, uh, please bring your children to Sunday school. So, uh, uh, and this was a group of Libyan brothers uh, who had come, Libyan families, and they uh, they did they were very surprised that there is uh, Juma prayers and and because uh, evidently they did, they were not part of the community. So I invited them and they came to Juma prayers and sent their children. Mashallah, they had many many children started coming at the same time the the group uh, who are managing this uh, uh, warehouse uh, facility were talking of purchasing um, a place and then with to get with with, with the uh, financial backing of the community as well predominantly with this group of libyan big business people they were libyan people they purchased a, 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 a church and Catherine Street, um, uh, which is still uh, running as a masjid. So they moved from Ka the warehouse, we moved from the warehouse to Catherine Street, and I started the school continuing for about 11 years. And then after uh, my children had grown now, they have gone into to, uh, high school, I felt like it's time to, for me to pass this uh, uh, a school to to by this time the name had changed also they became uh, MCA Muslim Community Center so the the, uh, the uh, school I transferred to them and the, it was about time for me to concentrate heavily uh, from a service oriented thing to my own spirituality and I um, uh, the, it's a long story but. I ended up going to London every year to follow my uh, teacher, uh, at, uh, which is the Nashbandi Tariqat uh, teacher, which is the, I had grown up, grown up uh, with that. My father, uh, as a child, uh, as a young people, had instilled this thing that you have to work on your heart. So um, I heard the, the, the news and that there is a sheikh from Turkey, from Cyprus, comes to London every year. And I, uh, I was quite ill this, uh, for a few years this time for some reason. The doctors did not know what is uh, wrong. Uh, so somebody suggested that maybe you should go and see the sheikh. Maybe it will be uh, somehow uh, helpful to you. But uh, when I went to London, uh, quickly, I, I realized I'm not there to find a remedy for my physical ailments. I'm there to find a remedy for my uh, inner spiritual uh, uh, development. So for uh, at the time that coincided that I transferred the school to the uh, um, MCA people, I, I embarked for about 12 years going to the uh, uh, London and uh, uh, for two weeks at a time, every, every Ramadan, I used to go there because he would come from Turkey, from Cyprus to uh, London, and thousands and thousands of people around the world were coming to meet him. When I met him, maybe there was about 50 followers. By the time I, in 12 years, when I um, uh, 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 
Mm -hmm. In 12 years, there was hundreds and thousands of people gathered around him and became Muslim uh, by sitting in his company. Yeah, th uh, thank you so much, Auntie, for sharing that. Um, it, you know, it's always appreciative when our guests, you know, uh, are so open enough to share, you know, those type of personal things. Um, I'm, I'm curious, um, the your teacher in in Tur in Cyprus or who you know visited from Cyprus um, is that Sheikh uh, uh, Nizam? No, Sheikh or Sheikh Muhammad. Abani. No, 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 he's not my sheikh. Uh, uh, sheikh uh, Muhammad Nazim al Haqqani is my sheikh. Haqqani, that's right. Yes. And uh, he is the father in law of uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Hisham Kabani. But my line goes directly to Sheikh Nazim al Haqqani. And that's right. I, I thought so. Yeah, and that, that was the person I was referencing. Uh, sorry, it was uh, Sheikh Nazim. Uh, mm -hmm. that's right that's right yeah. mashallah um so that that's amazing i mean I, and like you said i mean thousands of people come into islam through him um and you have some amazing um opportunities to spend with him um i, I guess so while you're there meanwhile here back at home in the bay area I, I, like you already mentioned sort of you have two growing you have two sort of growing communities, SBIA and MCA. Um, and I think you mentioned the Catherine Street, Street Mosque, which I think was initially Majid al Noor, I think yes. what it was called. Yeah. And I only reference that because other people on the show have mentioned, you know, mentioned it. So I want to, I like to mm. sort of, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that that connective tissue still remains. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess now that you're back um, in the Bay Area, um, you know, I guess what what is happening in the community that I think is worth noting. Are we and and I guess in terms of a period check, are we in the eighties now or are we past that? But uh, mid eighties to uh, early nineties. Okay. Um, after I uh, pulled myself out of the uh, uh, Catherine Street School Sunday School, by this time we had hundreds of students. Uh, but as I said, I wanted to. Uh, uh, go my own way of uh, developing my own spirituality. And uh, so uh, during my visits to London, uh, it, it was given to me that if you want to serve your rep, you have to, to serve the humanity. And uh, yes, it, all these years, um, on a part-time basis, Sunday schools, Juma, arranging Juma prayers and all that. But now I was thinking uh, uh, to serve your creator, in order to serve your creator, you have to serve your uh, his creation. And I was, this was keep on coming in my mind. How can one serve Allah through serving his creation? So it came to a, a uh, Ramazan 1993 on the 21st of Ramazan, this thought, this uh, uh, voice kept on magnifying in me and I this, that decided that I want to uh, do itikaf and by this time my children had uh, gone to college. I was uh, contemplating whether I should go back to my career or whether I should, uh, what should I do? What does that mean, serve your creator by serving his creations. So another friend of mine at the, uh, uh, on the 19th of Ramazan told me that, you know, um, uh, everyone that I ask, because I want to do something uh, the, in the form of charity, they're telling me to go to talk to Habiba. Are you Habiba? She had not met me. This was a young woman, very successful in the, in the uh, um, uh, high tech industry, uh, grown, born and grown in London, uh, very fashionable, very sophisticated. She said, uh, I don't know why everybody is directing me to you and um, I want to, uh, uh, are you Habiba? And I said, yes, why did you want to meet me? She said, um, I like to start something like in the field of charity. Uh, I, so I told her, well, I'm at the junction of my life that I don't know what I'm supposed to do so uh, but I want to do it to cough uh, for uh, 10 days ask Allah Ta'ala to guide me what I should do 
So alhamdulillah, that night when I went to, came back from Tarabia, we did the Tarabia downtown uh, masjid, uh, Third Street. Uh, we were living in Saratoga at that time. So uh, when I went to sleep, I woke up with this Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahim uh, voice in, in my uh, uh, head. So I opened this uh, uh, booklet randomly, um, uh, which was the booklet which is written by um, Sheikh Nazim's Sheikh, Sheikh Abdullah Dalastani, Rahmatullah And it says that uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy is infinite. Uh, he gives to people whether they recognize him or not. And he gives the, his rahmah to uh, entire humanity uh, and entire creation. However, there are certain people who uh, consciously work their, on their egos to uh, uh, surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have a special kind of a rahmah and that is uh, as ar-Rahim. And ar-Rahim is combined with mercy, compassion, and justice. When I read that, I thought justice, and uh, and then it explains that people who consciously fight against their naps cannot be same as those people who are asleep in, in their entire life, unaware of their uh, uh, ego. And naturally, it is just for Allah Ta'ala to reward these people a, an additional rahma, and that rahma will be given to them on the day of judgment. And when I read this thing, I was just crying, and I just felt like, wow, this is what uh, Allah wants me to, and my sheikh has been saying this, uh, to serve your creator uh, by serving his creation, and this fits in, in my, my inner uh, voice. So I said, then we are going to start something under a feminine form of Ar-Rahim, which is Rahima, and I'm going to start uh, something, inshallah. Uh, and then the next day I went back to, to the masjid, my friend Salma, now her name is Salma Basi, she said, I thought you were doing itifak. I said, because I got my answer. I said, yes, we are going to start the Rahima. And it was Ramazan I mean, 1993. I guess for those for those who are not familiar, uh, that uh, young lady could you talk a little uh, bit about uh, and, and maybe perhaps uh, Ishala Gok, if you want to jump in anytime, please do so. People, um, you know, people. with regards to and the uh, sort of mission statement, if you will, or the or what the organization uh, seeks to this do is and does. Story and history of Rahima, and I'm just. Uh, hoping that Allah Ta'ala will give me... Well, I, I guess I guess it's a question for you too, Ishra I mean, I, I'm just deserve. assuming you're involved, but um, maybe that's not the case. He will accept I mean, you're involved by virtue of, that I will you know, of course, that aunties in supporting her and her, her work, but it, I mean, I, I, I mean, is this something that both of you started, uh, or walk us through that, perhaps? Yeah. We can talk about the mission. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I we both we both didn't uh, we we both did not start it. Uh, it was it was Habiba's doing. But I was, I mean, obviously it's a less uh, uh, doing. Holding it in front of us. It wasn't my mind or my thoughts or whatever. It was just given to me. And it was I don't inspiration know from Allah so for you to start and, and it was made possible. So I was peripherally involved for all these years because I was working full time and, and so on. But after I retired, mm -hmm. Uh, I joined Rahima 
uh, because the board members so were insisting that, that uh, I should be if part you, of it. Well, it would allow so in then, 2014 like, to sort of flesh uh, out again right for matters. those who don't know and are not familiar with the organization. Yeah, you know, to that, talk so. about the mission and what, what um, the organization more does. Obviously and then, Omar, I would, you know, you can the, uh, the kind of volunteerism that it that it inspires. And, and, and then, Jessica, thank you for giving us the opportunity because you know, a number of people. I I remember volunteer having the opportunity to to go there and and just you know, put in a couple hours on, on a periodic basis, which, which is just an opportunity f for any, any volunteers. You're giving us the opportunity. You're giving um, younger volunteers the opportunity to experience with that. And then obviously mo most importantly, the, the people that are being helped. So it's, it's, it's a really, I, for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at this point, first of all, I want to recognize and be grateful to Allah Ta'ala that he gave me a partner who supported me with my uh, crazy uh, ways of every year leaving him with three children and going to London to uh, to be in the company of my chef. And, uh, uh, and then when this inspiration came for him to uh, uh, make it official, register it, uh, help me write the mission and vision of this uh, organization. And then as he said, preferably uh, he was working, of course, he could not be involved so much. But uh, uh, every weekend that I was uh, on the food distribution, he supported me. So without uh, his support, this would not have been possible, alhamdulillah. What is the mission is a vast mission. However, for past 27 years, every time we wanted to divert our attention to some other uh, um, areas of the community's need, it has not um, uh, been possible. Uh, uh, fruitful. So this shows that our mission is mainly is to feed the people, is to feed the people. Alhamdulillah, with the, uh, a few canned goods and uh, rice and um, flour collection, today we are uh, distributing close to uh, the, close to 20 tons of uh, groceries uh, to um, uh, the, every month uh, uh, and uh, giving halal uh, items to our Muslim brothers and non-Muslim especially during the, the uh, COVID there's a lot of uh, neighborhood people have been coming and somehow with a skeleton um, uh, staff and uh, regular volunteers it is every day we witness the miracle of how we are able to do this with such a that, um, few uh, uh, people. And alhamdulillah, we never had a single fundraiser. How is the, the funding is coming? It is just unbelievably somehow when we need it, somebody comes, gives a big check. Uh, uh, when we need something specific, uh, 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 for example, dates and, and Ramazan, if we are short, all of the sudden some sister comes and comes and brings uh, uh, several uh, boxes of uh, dates. So this is an organ, I cannot call it an organization. It's, it's an activity which I feel that every one of us like is being moved it is not that what we are doing. It is nothing that we have, we are, we are claiming any credit for. It. It's just rightful that Allah has chosen, chosen on to help these people who are in need, especially in this COVID year. It totally has culminated our mission to be in the distribution of groceries and make sure that they stay in their house. Alhamdulillah, this past year, we distributed over a million dollars in form of zakat as a financial assistance so people could not lose their uh, 
and the housing. Uh, so this is our mission. It's just give food and make sure that people are not uh, homeless. Yeah, that, that's that's amazing, and you and so many people have been helped, mashallah. And and I would, like I said, I was just alluding to earlier. You know, it's it's also an opportunity for people who are um, just looking for inspiration to, to 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 volunteer as well. You you also opportunity opportunity for young people, young people who are just getting into that world of giving back. Uh, you give them an, their maybe their first experience. Um, so that's that's just a side, a, a side blessing, but uh, you've been doing this for thirty, almost thirty years now. Um, uh, twenty eight so years. Twenty eight years. Twenty eight years and the twenty first of Ramadan, inshallah. Mashallah, that's amazing. And um, so, just as we get close to the to the end of the show, just want to hear about you know what's what's next, what's next for Rahima, and what is next for the both of you, inshallah. Um, uh, you know, are you, how long are you going to are you going to keep uh, keep doing this? Uh, I know you've alluded to you know potentially um, at some point uh, handing it off, but uh, tell us tell us tell us kind of what's 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 next for both yourselves as well as Rahima. Well, uh, the, my uh, the desires of uh, having a permanent home for Rahima because we moved from my garage, starting it from my garage to finally having our. Uh, the warehouse, which is uh, over 6,000 uh, square feet, uh, and we purchased that. It came again in the month of Ramadan. Uh, the, before that, and um, we bought a smaller place, and uh, now we are permanently there. And then, alhamdulillah, my uh, desire is to, to leave an endowment uh, in the, for the organization, for the rainy days, uh, because with the climate change and with this corona situation type things, you never know that the, the people are going to be people who have who used to donate to Rahima. And there were certain times that they needed help from Rahima. Alhamdulillah, we are very, very. Uh, I am very strict about uh, volunteers, the regular volunteers and the staff to keep everything. Uh, confidential because people who are receiving this help is from the community. The people who are, we've been seeing them socially possibly, as I said, people who have been donating. And so we are very, very confidentially, uh, we keep uh, the, because of this uh, community, we are not sending the money overseas that, which is, uh, we, we will never meet them. So um, the next, uh, um, the, other thing was that I needed three uh, consecutive uh, uh, audit uh, to have clean audits. Alhamdulillah, we had two. We are going through at this point and our third one. And the signs are good that Alhamdulillah, that's also. And then the next thing is to find the three to five sincere hearts. This was one of the formulas that my sheikh had said. If you find three to five sincere hearts, on the same point, uh, you can change the world. Thank you so much, Auntie. And that's probably a great place to stop. Um, you've done an amazing job sharing the history of Haikuna's country and how you met, and of course, how Rahima was founded and uh, um, all the great work that Rahima has done. For our audience, for our listeners, if you want to learn more about Rahima and contribute, you can go to their website at rahima.org. Uh, and please donate, especially in the spirit of Ramadan. They're doing great work um, and they can uh, definitely, um, uh, you know, you can definitely donate and, and help them out even more. So as we wrap, just want to remind our users to our, our listeners to uh, continue giving us great feedback. Uh, we, we're trying to make the show better and better over time. Uh, you can reach us at Facebook, um, on Twitter. Uh, and if you if you feel inclined, uh, become a patron of the show. Go to patreon.com uh, forward slash diffuse congruence, uh, and you can learn how to uh, become a supporter of the show. So until then, have a blessed Ramadan, and inshallah, we'll talk to you soon. Take care, Assalamualaikum, folks.